for, uh, I'm Jim Lane, I'm the new uh, chair of the Philadelphia Sempty chapter, for better or for worse. Um, thank you everyone for your patience, uh, it's really, we're not happy that we had to cancel the meeting in September, but it was just logistics. We really tried to kick off the year with a bang and it kind of whimpered. But uh, the good news is that program will be on for uh, November next month. Um, it is going to be done by Chesapeake Systems, uh, which is the company that put together the collaborative editing system for the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, right now we're, uh, we're not sure of the venue. Um, we're hoping to have it down in South Philly at the sports complex. Um, and if that doesn't work, we do have a backup. So that meeting is on for November 13th. Um, and it's, it's really interesting. I saw the presentation, and Steve saw it too, uh, down at Bits by the Bay uh, at, at their SEMTI conference in May. Um, and it's a really interesting um, uh, thing how they've, they've set up the collaborative editing between the Lincoln Financial Field and the Novacare Center and tied into to the NFL all at the same time while the games are going on. So it's a pretty, uh, it'll be, be really interesting. Um, as I said, this is my first time at the chair, so uh, as chair, so I'm going to forget things. Um, number one, we have, have some new people, and it's great, and some people that we haven't seen for a while. Um, so I'd like to do the quick round robin. Uh, again, I'm Jim Lean with Toner Cable. Just say your name and where you're from. Uh, Joe Wozniak, uh, ERI. Randy Wolfson, Presentational Tech Services. Over here. Oh, yeah. Don Train, Train Towers. Rick Gamble, Stepdog Media. <laughs> Ken Hur, retired, but I can't seem to stop working. Bill Stab, out of this corporation. Jim Wiley, with the CBI. Jeff Beal, who is my district. Big Smart, retired. There. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, if you're not a SEMTI member, um, please consider joining. It's a it's a valuable tool. As you uh, for for especially for the younger people or people trying to um, make connections in the in the in the television and in this video industry. Uh, Chuck, are you still membership coordinator or? <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> okay, um, I'd like to. Th <laughs> I would like to thank Toner Cable for um, hosting us tonight, uh, and uh, Joe Woz uh, Wozniak for providing the food. Um, it's been a bit of a challenge. Yep. Yep. It has been a bit of a challenge getting uh, locations for the first couple months. So uh, I want to thank B.J. Toner, even though he's not here, um, for uh, allowing us to use the facility. Um, trying a couple. Uh, if you, in case you didn't notice, we are streaming the the presentation tonight. We're going to try to do that as many meetings as possible. Um, and according to Tom, we already have seven people watching. Uh, one of them is our. Uh, uh, the toner um, representative out on the West Coast, Yuri Stentner. Um, and w the other thing we're trying just to mess around a little bit with some new things is we're also, um, uh, Yuri's also going to be able to see all the PowerPoints and everything. Yes? We're also streaming to, uh, oh, that's right. We're streaming to Millersville University, their student chapter out there. Uh, we have a real push this year for getting student chapters started. Um, Mark Mullen out at Millersville has started one. Uh, there's a real active one down at, um, is it Townsend State or Loyola in Baltimore? One of the two. Um, and, uh, and I think there's also one up at um, uh, Montclair State in, um, in New Jersey. So we're really making a push to get these, uh, these uh, uh, student chapters started. Uh, I'd like to invite Steve DC to come up for a couple minutes and just give you a little introduction as to um, of what toner is about, and then we'll get on with the presentation. 
and don't look into the light. It hurts. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, it does. <laughs> uh, my name is Steve DC, and uh, I'm here with Toner Cable. I've been with the company uh, 39 years, so I wanted to thank you all for coming here tonight. Some of you may not know Toner Cable. Uh, we started out in the 1971 in the cable industry when it was being built. Cable companies were in franchise. And so we worked a lot with independent cable operators, MSOs, and uh, provided everything from like satellite dish, five meter satellite dish, towers, antennas, uh, analog head ends, 12 channel analog head ends back then. And uh, once the industry became saturated, pretty much built throughout the country, we looked around and uh, you know, found ourselves diversifying into different markets. There were still schools, there was colleges, there was uh, hospitals. They all had their own cable television system and they needed help with it. And so we diversified into many, many markets and uh, we continue to get into many markets today. And as we see, the, the industry has continually uh, revolved and changed. HD, digital, IPTV, MPEG-4, uh, all this has changed. And we provide a lot of the head ends today for, uh, for even colleges and schools and, and broadcasters. So uh, we really have continued to grow. We've just probably about a year to two years ago, we've added uh, an engineering service to our, to our company where we have engineering teams that go out into the field and install these head ends and support a lot of the uh, operators out there that, that don't know how to work this, this type of equipment. So, um, you know, we continue to, re to diversify and get into different markets and that's where we are today and that's who we are. We have, um, uh, like, like Jim said, we have a salesman in California, we have two down in Florida, and um, we have one that handles Latin America, we have a European market warehouse, and a European salesman taking care of uh, the UK market. So we, uh, we continue to grow, and we continue to grow because it's a lot of you guys that bring ideas to us, help us, and continue uh, who we are today. So again, thanks for coming by, and I hope you have a good session here today. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um, did you want to switch this over? Did you have it ready to go? Or? I'll, let you, I'll let you do it. Okay. Um, so, oh, by the way, uh, if you are on the uh, watching on the live stream, the chat is active. So, if you want to chat any questions or uh, comments, uh, please do. And if you are on the live stream, if you can, if you didn't see it on the uh, screen, please uh, send an email to comments at org so we can count you into the attendance for tonight. So, tonight um, we are pleased to have with us Joe Wozniak of Electronics Research Inc. Uh, Joe and I have known each other a long time. We knew each other through, I guess, through SEMPTI and through professionally. And one day, I think we were at the, um, I think we were at the the uh, parish fair at Sacred Heart Church in Royersford, and we went, wait a minute, <laughs> and found out that we lived like a mile from each other. Never knew it. Um, so the, tonight, the presentation is Channel Repack Survival Guide: Antennas, RF Systems, and Transmission Line. Television broadcasters across the country are currently facing a challenge of moving many of their licensed stations to new channels under the FCC Spectrum Repack Plan, which is resulting in the recent FCC auction of Spectrum and the upper UHF TV band. Thousands of television transmitters, antennas, as well as flexible and rigid, rigid coax transmission lines are being purchased to comply. Much of the costs are being reimbursed by the FCC. In addition, structural analysis of these supporting towers is being conducted resulting in numerous tower reinforcements and even new towers due to these changes. Uh, ERI, Joe's company, is a major source of equipment and services required. The presentation, while focused on products, will also give the listeners a chance to think about how the broadcaster with a one-to-many wireless video distribution model can become a much bigger player in the future 
of video to mobile devices and different size screens. So Joe Wozniak is a 35-year veteran of the broadcast equipment industry, having experience in the sales and marketing of television transmitters, television translators, and complete UHF and VHF transmission systems, including antennas, transmission line. Joe has worked for Acrodyne Industries, Videotech, Larkan, operated a small business named Maple Leaf RF, and most recently joined ERA, ERI, a leading manufacturer of television and radio antennas and RF systems. ERI is also a leader in the manufacture of communication towers up to 2,000 feet and employs a well-respected staff of structural engineers and tall tower climbers. So I'm going to turn it over to Joe and uh, enjoy the presentation. Thank you so much, Jim. <coughs> Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Steve, for uh, hosting. Um, really nice to be here. Um, this is uh, something I don't do on a regular basis, so you'll have to bear with me. But, uh, uh, but we have a lot of good information here. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, we all can learn something. It was really interesting to hear that Millersville and, and, and the uh, idea of, of getting um, uh, students involved in the organization is, um, uh, I think, uh, uh, really good to hear because I was talking to some guys earlier that I know, I've known for a long, long time, RF guys, and you know we are kind of a dying breed. And the idea of bringing young people along uh, to learn this stuff, uh, I think, is a really good thing. Um, we've got a lot of forces going on out there. Uh, the industry is exploding uh, and going through some major changes. Uh, broadcast is the original wireless business, <laughs> wireless distribution business for video, and. Uh, and there's a, uh, the way things are uh, evolving right now, um, the um, FCC has actually just authorized a, a new system that, could be, that, that will begin to be deployed uh, that is commonly referred to in the industry as ATSC3 that will actually allow uh, signals to be more readily received by mobile devices, devices that are moving, um, uh, you know, whether it's a, a cell phone in your pocket or, or uh, uh, some sort of receiving device in a car, what have you. Uh, so anyway. Uh, broadcasters today are uh, addressing that future for the industry, but um, the primary thing that we're dealing with right now is a thing we all call repack. <laughs> and so, how many in this room uh, actually know what the word repack means? <laughs> okay, that looks like about half maybe. Okay, all right. Uh, I'm sure all the former uh, RF, uh, the RF guys in the in the room, uh, such as Jim and 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 Walt um, and others, uh, Don, uh, you know, are you know are active in the industry and, and uh, are real familiar with uh, with what's going on. Um, but so that's going to be the focus of my presentation. And uh, and ERI is one of the uh, primary uh, suppliers for that industry. And so um, we're really busy right now, <laughs> extremely busy. Uh, and so let me um, uh, start by, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, a little uh, shameless commercial uh, for for the for the company, and it, it's not just a uh, you know a promotional video. It tells it does tell you a little bit more about what I'll be talking about, and how ERI fits into what we call repack. ATSC 1.0 today and ATSC 3.0 tomorrow with no 
risky modifications needed in the future. ERI knows a broadcaster's audience is not always evenly spread across a geographic area. That's why we install independent horizontal slots and vertical dipoles on our antennas, giving broadcast stations the power to reach specific audiences where they live and save on energy costs while doing it. At ERI's 100-acre campus, we design, manufacture, tune, and test every antenna in-house, allowing us to oversee each step in the process and maintain maximum quality control. Our expertise doesn't stop at high-power television antennas either. We lead the industry in broadcast tower design, fabrication, and installation, as well as tower safety training and education. We are the full-service broadcast solutions provider that broadcasters need now and for the future. I'm going to start with a little background again. Um, I know some of you are familiar with Repack, and oh, jeez, thanks, Jim. Okay, <laughs> um, but again, just to give a little overview, especially those that aren't in, in the RF uh, uh, part of the business, um, this is um, this is the VHF the television band. Okay, we started channel two down at 54 megahertz. And we go all the way up on the high, uh, and, and, and channel two to channel six are commonly referred to in a business as low band VHF channels. And you can see they, they fall below the FM band from 54 megahertz all the way up to 88 megahertz. Uh, the VHF high band, and that would be channel seven to 13, fall between 174 megahertz and 200, 216 megahertz. That part of the band is not changing. And in fact, a lot of broadcasters that formerly were on UHF channels are going to wind up in this band. Okay? The FCC actually gave some incentive uh, for broadcasters to give up their UHF frequency and pick either a, a low band or a high band VHF channel. Now, as many as you probably know, again, our, the RF guys in the room know that the low band channels do not perform very well in digital service. Um, with that said, we have two low-band channels right here in the city. <laughs> and Jim, <laughs> you work for one of them. <laughs> um, you can overcome some of the issues with operating in the low-band with power because it's a noise uh, uh, issue, basically. And it could be uh, even man-made noise that interferes with those signals. But they're clearly not uh, very uh, attractive in terms of uh, eventually reaching a mobile audience. And another reason why the FCC was giving uh, some incentive to move to these bands. Okay. We make VHF equipment. We make VHF antennas. And uh, some of the repack stations are moving to these channels, as I mentioned. But the focus of uh, what we'll talk about is uh, in the UHF band. Okay, so here we have so here we have the the UHF band, and uh, for many of us in the room uh, that started in this business decades ago, uh, that band even went up to channel eighty something. But since I've been in this business since 1983, the highest channel has been channel 69. Um, 69 has been gone for a while now. Um, the 700 megahertz band was auctioned off uh, a few years back. So for most of the uh, um, uh, last 10 years, the highest UHF channel has been channel 51. Okay? So from channels four 14, which starts at 470 megahertz, all the way up to channel 51, which ends right uh, at the 700 megahertz level, or frequency, uh, that's been what we call the core uh, UHF uh, uh, channel, uh, uh, list of channels. <clears throat> so what we just went through 
is a, uh, a pair of auctions. In 2017, the FCC had two sets of auctions. One they commonly referred to as the reverse auction, where the broadcaster had a chance to sell their license back to the FCC. They, could, they had three options, either sell their license back to the FCC, they could um, take a, a low band channel and get X number of dollars, or they could take a high band VHF channel and get X number of dollars. And all this was contingent on whether or not there were channels available and whether or not there was demand for their frequency. Okay? Um, so, that was the reverse auction. And then there was a forward auction. And the forward auction was a chance for bidders to bid for these frequencies right in here, basically the 600 megahertz band. So the 600 megahertz band went out to auction, and the FCC raised, uh, from everything I hear, about $20 billion, far short of what they thought way back when, about five years ago, when they were talking about something on the order of $70 billion. But nevertheless, $20 billion for the Treasury. Uh, one of the big players happened to be T-Mobile. So T-Mobile has spent on the order of $10 billion, maybe about half of that or so. <laughs> Uh, they were one of the major players uh, in the uh, auction of uh, those channels. So, what Repack is all about is moving everything, all TV services, in the band from channels 38 to 51, which starts at me uh, 614 megahertz and goes up to basically 600 megahertz, uh, 700 megahertz. Uh, channel 37 is reserved for radio astronomy, so nobody in case you haven't ever noticed, <laughs> it's on channel 37, never have been. So going forward, the highest UHF channel in the TV broadcast band will be channel 36. So everybody that's in this band has got to get out of it. And as a consequence of moving all these frequency, there's a domino effect that goes clear across the country. So not only are these uh, stations being uh, repacked, but there's a number of stations, hundreds of them, in the core channels that have also been repacked. So it's created quite a demand for, uh, for antennas, transmitters, transmission line, um, quite a demand. We are, there's literally thousands of stations counting not only the full power stations that operate in that band, but the low power uh, stations and the TV translator stations as well. And so, what we have is a plan to get this done by July of 2020, the end of phase 10. So we are actually right at the uh, very beginning of this repack. You can see phase one uh, started uh, just last month. Now, incredibly, <laughs> the FCC added a phase zero the phase zero happened to be a certain number of stations that had uh, particular uh, requirements. One of them uh, actually happens to be all the stations in Puerto Rico because of Hurricane Maria that blew through there uh, and all the destruction that the hurricane caused. Uh, the FCC gave all the stations in Puerto Rico a chance to move uh, in advance of where they were actually uh, situated in the uh, phase uh, uh, of stations to be re uh, repacked. So. So there actually was a phase zero. You can see we're past that phase completion date already. And we're into phase one now. <clears throat> so you can see it's a very aggressive program. And most experts said it can't be done. <laughs> and there's still some question as whether or not it can be done. But uh, the FCC has insisted from day one that it will be done. And everybody's agreed to do everything they can to make sure that this, uh, this schedule is, is met. So the way this works is that uh, if you're in phase one, your phase completion date is November 30th, 2018, which, of course, is the end of next month. At the end of next month, if you're not on your new channel, you're off the air. So it's very critical that everybody that has an assigned phase date, uh, phase completion date, builds out on their new channel um, by the end of the phase completion date. Does anybody have any questions about this? Because this is really kind of an introduction. No? Question? Can you touch a little on how the other end works? Like if somebody wants to watch their channel when it moves over, how does it work from the viewer's side of things? Okay, that's a really good question. Um, and that's part of the reason for this uh, uh, method of assigning stations in phases. 
because what the uh, FCC uh, envisioned is that a, a given market, in, in a given market, all the stations would change channels at the same time. And therefore, there could be public uh, uh, PSAs, or whatever you would call them, uh, that would announce that by, let's say, November 30th, uh, in the case of phase one, you're going to have to rescan your TV set so that you can uh, pick up your favorite channels now on, on a different frequency. And of course, as we all know, er, the, the beauty of digital television is that all stations have a virtual channel. So the viewer is really um, pretty much <laughs> uh, unaware, I would say, of uh, actually what frequency they're receiving uh, ch uh, channels on, right? But you're right. Uh, they, they have to take an action. Otherwise, uh, they stand to lose uh, their favorite TV stations. Yes? Well, as stations are moving, though, to down to the VHF band, you're going to have consumers that won't have suitable antennas. That's, a, that's, that's been a major problem in the industry for yeah. quite a while. Um, yes. Um, it doesn't seem to me like there's much public information going out about that. that you may need to upgrade your antenna. Well, I can tell you there's a lot of chief engineers out there that deal with those questions from uh, viewers all the time. And, and they're tough ones to answer because Radio Shack is gone mm -hmm. and uh, buying antennas online is somewhat problematic because, you know, there's a lot of bad information out there. There's a lot of commercials out there that are just uh, not true. They're not telling uh, viewers what the truth is about how you have to receive signals, especially, as you're saying, in the VHF band. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no way that a little... <laughs> dongle on the back of your TV set is going to pick up channel two, three, four, five, or six. Jim, I'm sure you know you're one of those that have to deal with these questions all the time. Once, Once or <laughs> twice, yeah. But uh, and it's a real shame because uh, those signals are out there. There's a lot of cool programming out there. Um, as we know, the industry has come a long way in uh, taking full advantage of digital television with uh, you know, with HD and multiple SD channels as sub-channels, so there's a lot of quality programming. In this city alone, how many channels, guys? Maybe 40 channels or so, right? I get 75. 75, there you go. Maybe you have a rotor on your antenna, right? <laughs> no? No? Okay, beautiful. Minus like the Roxborough. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, mm-hmm. Okay, any other questions? All right, okay, with that I'll uh, try and get going here. So there are really five core businesses within uh, ERI. Um, antennas uh, are one of the primary businesses of ERI. Um, radio antennas, big percentage of the market. ERI has a huge percentage of the uh, FM antenna business. On the TV side, um, ERI purchased the former Andrew product line. You heard them talk in the video about the Tracer. The Tracer was originally designed by the old Andrew Corporation. Uh, ERI picked up that product line uh, around 2002, 2003, right in, out in there. So we've had the product line for about 15 years or so. The Tracer antennas, uh, very well known, widely used throughout the country. I'll be talking a little bit about you know, some of the advantages of that design. Um, the ALP uh, series of uh, medium and low power antennas, very uh, widely used in TV translator and, and low power TV service. Um, and then there's some other designs that you know, I'll, I'll show you. Uh, transmission line, uh, the uh, ERI Max Line series, which uh, has a unique interconductor uh, feature, uh, is very widely used. Uh, there's some real advantages there. Towers, the tower business is uh, an important part of uh, uh, what we call the structural division of the company. Uh, but that includes not only towers, but structural analyses, uh, tower reinforcements, um, and, um, and actually installation services too. Uh, and that's a huge part of our business right now. Um, we're, uh, we're doing a lot of work on the tower side and on the installation side, installing not only ERI antennas, but antennas by our, our competitors as well. I'm sorry. Are you getting Question? into the micro towers for 5G at all, or are you more to the uh, no. broadcast TV side? Yeah, broadcast TV side. Yeah, these are towers, uh, self-supported towers, let's say, maybe up to 500 feet or so and uh, guide towers up to 2,000 feet, right. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's uh, the, uh, the uh, RF system or filters combiners part of the business. Uh, so we do business with all the major OEMs in the business, um, Comark, Gates Air, 
Roan Schwartz, for example. Um, we have uh, a very, uh, uh, some really nice designs there, including a, um, uh, a, white, uh, a tunable uh, UHF filter, uh, both six pole and eight pole size. Uh, and then, uh, then there's broadcast services, I, and I kind of put that in with the tower business, but that, that includes uh, tower climbers um, and uh, all the insulation work that goes along with uh, maintaining, uh, reinforcing, and building new towers. <coughs> Excuse me. Any? So, so the uh, engineering department put together what they call this TV repack survival guide. Um, again, we're already into the repack, but we're still talking about it. There's still a lot of work to do, still a lot of equipment to be purchased. Um, there's, it comes in th uh, they put this together in three different parts, and, and um, the first part we'll start with is antennas. Okay? So again, uh, some of you RF guys out there will, will find this stuff pretty basic. I'll, uh, I'll try and make it interesting for everybody from uh, someone that knows nothing about TV antennas to those of us that have dealt with them for decades. So again, <laughs> we start out with something pretty basic, right? <laughs> what is an antenna after all? So the way the uh, engineering guys des uh, describe it is a TV antenna is a passive device which accepts full power TPO from the transmitter, usually conditioned and attenuated through filters and transmission line, and radiates, siphon focuses the RF signal toward a targeted area of population or population to a permitted level or field strength as licensed by the FCC. Okay, so we all get that, right? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. So I brought along one prop. It's the nozzle from my, uh, one of my garden hoses. <laughs> so for those of you who maybe don't know exactly how an antenna works, um, years ago I, went, I, I, I sat in on a presentation where this was used as a, uh, a way of describing what a TV antenna does. So if you're all, you know, th this is a pretty common nozzle today. In the old days you just had a simple nozzle that, you know, you, either got a fine spray or you got a, a, a very direct spray. Now you have all kinds of different sprays that are available to you, right? And um, in some cases, the spray goes in all directions in a circle. Uh, in some cases, where they, like there's one here they call a jet. Uh, it's, it's pretty much a, a, a straight arrow, <laughs> okay? Uh, and then there's another one they call a fan and a cone. And again, it, it describes pretty well what the, what the spray would look like. Um, and so basically what these nozzles do is they focus the water coming out of the hose in, and, and if you, you could look at it as uh, they focus it in the two planes, right? The horizontal and the vertical plane, right? So if it was focused entirely in the horizontal plane, you'd have uh, somewhat what they call a fan on here, okay? Where it's coming out sort of just in a, in a flat plane, um, but spread across, uh, you know, almost 180 degree area, right? Uh, something like a shower is more circular, okay, it's got, it's got water spraying in all kinds of different directions and it's pretty much fanned down, okay? Um, and so, um, this is what an antenna does. It, it, it takes RF power coming out of a transmitter and then feeding a transmission line, well, the transmitter in turn then feeds a transmission line, which is uh, what takes, uh, what um, feeds that power into an antenna that's typically mounted uh, X number of feet above ground level. If you're on a mountaintop site, could be 100, a couple hundred feet, right? But if you're in the middle of a city uh, or in a rural area, um, suburban area, uh, and it's relatively flat and you, you don't have much height above uh, average terrain, you might have a 1,000 to 2,000 foot tower, okay? And so that transmission line has to connect that output of the transmitter all the way up to that antenna. Um, and so what an antenna does then is takes that RF power and focuses it, okay? And again, apologize to anyone who finds this pretty basic, but for the students at Millersville, that, that might, be a, a, that might uh, help them understand. Oops. So again, um, how does an antenna focus? So the performance of an antenna is really defined by, uh, primarily RF-wise, by, uh, by these three parameters. Uh, the horizontal pattern, which we refer to as the azimuth pattern, the vertical pattern, or the elevation plane pattern, and then beam tilt, okay? So the horizontal pattern is actually focusing, is either allowing the uh, uh, power to be transmitted uh, fairly equally around the complete circle, 
uh, surrounding the uh, tower, a 360 degree circle, right? Um, and and in, in many cases, that's the preferred uh, uh, azimuth pattern. Uh, in other cases, uh, might want to focus that, uh, that energy in a little more uh, directional way. So very commonly, we have what we call cardioid patterns, um, either wide or narrow, um, and even peanut-shaped patterns. And we'll get to all that in a second. Okay? But by focusing that power, you're not only getting the energy where you, the signal strength where you want it, uh, but you're also increasing the amount of power uh, or energy you can transmit in those, uh, those directions. The vertical uh, el or elevation pattern uh, has to do with how, basically how big the antenna is. Because the larger the antenna, the more radiating elements there are in an antenna in a vertical manner, the more focused that beam is going to be. So getting back to the hose uh, analogy, um, you know, if you look at it that way, it's going to focus that power instead of, obviously you don't want to transmit into outer space, right? <laughs> that doesn't do any viewer any good. So not only do you want to focus the power that otherwise uh, with an isotropic antenna would be going into outer space, you're focusing it down towards the Earth, okay? And so the elevation plane pattern uh, shows the consulting engineer how that uh, energy is uh, being focused towards the horizon and then, the dis and then in all the uh, locations between the horizon and the tower itself. Those two um, um, uh, patterns would have a gain figure associated with them. And again, depending on the directivity uh, of, uh, of each one. And then there's beam tilt. Uh, and beam tilt is another way that uh, broadcasters can take uh, advantage of uh, the power that's coming out of their transmitter. Uh, beam tilt allows them to either focus that energy at the horizon, where you normally need the most power because you've got the most propagation loss, or to some uh, place closer in, once again, between the horizon and the tower itself. So typically, there's some um, beam tilt. Uh, in other words, the main part of the beam is focused not at exactly at the horizon, but maybe you know, a half a degree or a degree or even in some cases more than that uh, from the horizon. And that oftentimes has a lot to do with how high the, the uh, site is above the average terrain. So if you're on a mountaintop and you're 1,000 feet above average terrain, it's more likely that you need to focus the power down towards a valley uh, or towards the surrounding area rather than uh, at the horizon. Uh, gains are referenced to the equivalent. Uh, oh, this is a word I'm not sure how to pronounce. <laughs> spheroidal, spheroidal field strength. I shouldn't have tried to read this. <laughs> it's field strength of a of a dipole. Anyway, so it, it's just uh, saying that the uh, the reference to uh, and, and when we when we speak again is to the um, is to a dipole. Okay. So a gain of 10 means the field strength at that point is 10 times what it would be with a dipole. The higher the gain, the sharper the focus or peak of beam. All right? And again, any questions about that? No? Okay. Okay, so once again, there's, uh, you know, these are some of the common uh, azimuth patterns. Uh, at the top there, you have um, an omnidirectional or, uh, pattern, which um, is re in reality never quite uh, a, a real circle, okay? A consulting engineer can specify a station to be non-directional. And as far as the FCC is concerned, you're broadcasting the same amount of signal in every direction from zero all the way around to 360 degrees, or, or three, 359 degrees. Um, but uh, I don't know how easy it is to see, but as you can see from the yellow, uh, azimuth pattern uh, on the top there, um, and, and the pattern is defined by the, the red line. It might be a little hard to see. Um, you can see that um, if it was a complete circle, that red line would actually cross the, uh, the outermost part of that polar plot. Okay? In other words, uh, the relative field in every direction is 1. But as you can see uh, from that um, typical pattern, uh, there are some places where it's not quite 1. Okay? And that's pretty, pretty common. Um, and, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about why in, uh, in some of the upcoming slides. Um, narrow cardioid pattern um, is a little more specific to uh, situations where um, the town is in a certain direction and the transmitter is at one end uh, of the town. Um, 
if a transmitter is uh, trying to cover an area in a valley, for example, uh, narrow cordary patterns are, are pretty common in those uh, applications. Um, uh, but in most cases, something a little wider than that is, is needed to cover an area. And so wider cardioid patterns, anything from a 90 degree to 180 degree coverage are, are, are fairly common. And especially for antennas that are mounted to a, the side of a tower. Uh, when mount an antenna to the side of the tower, the tower itself uh, will in fact interfere with, uh, with an antenna's radiating pattern. And so, and especially on the back side because those signals are actually um, going into the members of the tower, the vertical and horizontal members of the tower. So there's a lot of reflections, there's a scattering effect uh, that occurs when that happens. So um, cardioid patterns are pretty common um, uh, in those applications. So if you really do need uh, circular coverage, uh, an omnidirectional pattern, uh, the preferred method is to mount the antenna to the top of the tower. Um, and then there's a peanut pattern. They're, they're pretty common too, especially in coastal areas where the tower is located somewhere along the coast and the idea is to hit all these cities up and down the coast. And peanut patterns can take a lot of different shapes too. So this is just four uh, categories, if you will, of, uh, of antenna patterns, but there's lots of variations of these patterns. And ERI uh, can uh, actually customize patterns based on the uh, specific needs of, of any particular broadcaster serving any particular market. Okay, then we have the elevation pattern. So again, this is how the energy is being focused in, in the vertical plane. And for lower gain antennas, and again, the gain of the antenna is, is, is related to the height of the antenna. <clears throat> so the height of the antenna increases as you add radiating elements or slots in a, uh, in a slotted antenna. In a panel antenna, you stack panels, okay? Um, so uh, if an antenna is short uh, and it has a, a relatively low gain, then the elevation pattern is actually pretty wide. And, um, and that actually would be preferred in most cases because you want to be able to cover, um, again, not only uh, the potential viewers at the horizon and uh, near the horizon, but the, the viewers that are close into the tower as well. But oftentimes you need a bit more gain in order to, to cover a large market area. And that's where high gain antennas uh, become um, very popular. And uh, in the repack, we're looking at antennas that mostly have, in the UHF band that is, medium or high gain. And as you can see, as you go from medium to high gain, the vertical pattern gets narrower. Okay, and you want, actually wind up with what we call knolls as well. You see the uh, little dips in the pattern uh, on the right side. So if you were to actually uh, try and visualize how this works in the real world, you would actually rotate this pattern uh, 90 degrees, and this would be the energy towards the Earth, and this would be the energy on the top part of the beam, mostly going out beyond the horizon and, 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 uh, and, and, and useless in most cases. Okay, so what the uh, consulting engineer and the broadcaster get focused on is the, what the pattern looks like on the right side. That, that describes what the, uh, uh, you know, how the, uh, how the signal is being focused, how much it's being focused, and therefore um, what's the potential for actually overshooting your audience, and how are those nulls uh, actually going to be um, affect uh, the potential coverage throughout a uh, given uh, market area. And as you can see, um, you know beam tilts of uh, of various uh, uh, degrees are uh, available, and I'll get into that a little bit more here in the upcoming slides. Um, but these. Uh, uh, particular uh, patterns show, for example, in the low gain of 1.1 degree, beam tilt, and the medium gain of 1.5, and then the high gain of 1 degree. And if you were to look close, I know it's a little hard to see probably, uh, and it's, uh, the screen gets a little fuzzy at this, uh, at this size. But uh, the peak of the beam at the top, if you were to look closely enough, is something uh, to the right of uh, zero degrees, which would be uh, the horizon. Any questions about Patterns? Yeah. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah. No, I. Uh, no, you're quite, quite correct, uh, Walt. Yeah, I mean, this is, um, broadcasters and consulting engineers should really work together. Uh, the, the, the picking the right antenna patterns is really quite critical. Um, you know, especially in this day and age when energy isn't as cheap as it was back in the 60s and 70s, right? Uh, we've been through a few energy crises now, and who knows where we're headed in the future. But there is a lot of concern these days about energy bills, uh, you know, especially as the audience for over-the-air television has decreased. Now, you know, I'll get into, you know, some of the ways that that might change over the upcoming years. But as the audience for uh, over-the-air television has decreased, you know, the, the most general managers and, and, and broadcasters uh, uh, get concerned about how much they're paying uh, to power up their transmitter. So focusing that energy in the right places is really quite critical. Uh, you want to cover a market area, but yeah, you don't need w signal over the water. <laughs> Uh, you don't want to overshoot your audience, and high gain antennas uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, can uh, if they're not uh, properly uh, designed, uh, you know, with a proper beam tilt or what have you, uh, or null fill, can actually overshoot the audience. Absolutely. Okay. Any other questions? No. Okay. So beam tilt and null fill are an important part of an antenna design. Um, when the consulting engineer is looking at what kind of, uh, uh, how he wants to specify an antenna, he's going to be uh, looking at these things once again for the reasons we just stated. Uh, and as Walt uh, pointed out, you don't want signal to go where it's not needed, and you want to make sure you get as much signal as you can uh, where you can, um, you know, given uh, the parameters that you have to deal with in terms of interference. There, you know, and that's a whole other subject that, uh, you know, uh, I can uh, touch on here as well. Um, but again, beam tilt uh, is, um, um, going to be something that uh, you can control in the design of the antenna, okay? Uh, and uh, uh, one of the things uh, uh, about the antenna design is that specific types of designs will would be better suited for certain beam tilts than others. And the NFED design that uh, ERI makes uh, are ideally suited for beam tilts from 0.75 degrees and, and up, okay? Um, Null fill is a way of overcoming those nulls that you could see in those elevation patterns I just showed you. And um, here again, uh, what, what we'll, uh, I'll show in a future slide is that uh, the NFED tracer design, it was pointed out in the video as well, um, the way that, that uh, antenna is designed, uh, null fill is less uh, uh, necessary because the, those NFED antennas create well, what we would refer to as a relatively smooth elevation pattern. So those nulls are really not as pronounced as they are with center fed designs. Okay. With that said, uh, we can even make it smoother by again uh, working with the consulting engineer and getting uh, uh, getting the antenna designed uh, so that the pattern is as smooth as possible. Uh, and that, with that said, we do have what we call smooth uh, uh, elevation beam patterns to offer as uh, a standard uh, in our product line. Okay. Now we get to radiation polarity. Um, uh, man, I'm going to make myself sound old. Uh, in the old days, <laughs> um, most every television antenna was, was horizontally polarized uh, almost exclusively. They were almost all horizontally polarized. And, and there's a good reason for that uh, in the early days, especially when most of us uh, or most viewers might have had outdoor antennas. Outdoor antennas uh, would be receiving those signals primarily in the horizontal plane. So any energy that you produced in the vertical plane was really uh, wasted energy. Um, so today that's changing in a big way. So now uh, we're finding a lot of uh, antennas uh, that are uh, being purchased that are not just horizontally polarized but have a vertical component as well. And by virtue of the fact that they have a vertical component, uh, they wind up uh, being what we call an elliptically polarized antenna. Okay. So again, the horizontal polarization uh, refers to the radiated RF electrical field in the horizontal plane. Uh, and again, that's been the traditional TV signal polarization. And importantly, and this is important, it, it is what is prim only used, uh, solely used uh, by the FCC to assign a certain coverage area to a particular TV station. The FCC is only concerned about ERP and, uh, and your antenna pattern. <laughs> that's all they care about. Um, so, uh, and, 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 and as far as vertical polarization is concerned, uh, I'll get to this in a second, um, there are some limitations, but they're, they're not so concerned. Um, so, the future of television broadcasting, according to most broadcasters, is broadcasting to 
the cell phone is in your pocket, okay? All right, so it's, it's a little more complicated than just the antenna design, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and as you saw in the video, uh, there's a new uh, television broadcast standard uh, that the FCC has just authorized uh, to be used. It's commonly referred to as ATSC-3 that will allow signals to be received in these devices um, in a much more uh, robust way, okay? So uh, most of us would probably hold a cell phone like this maybe, uh, which means that uh, the antenna that's built into the, uh, that would be built into the phone is uh, kind of in a vertical direction, isn't it? So vertical polarization turns out to be, uh, all of a sudden, a very important part of the TV broadcast signal. Um, so this refers to the radiated RF electrical field that resonates in the vertical plane. Um, and as I just mentioned, this polarization becomes increasingly important because of mobile reception devices. So what most, so it's, it's really quite difficult, to be perfectly honest, uh, to replicate the horizontal polarization pattern in the vertical plane. And that's because you're really using two different sets of, uh, of um, radiators. Um, and a slotted antenna, uh, you'll have slots and, and, uh, that are, that are uh, with energy coupled off those slots. And in a vertical plane, you'll have um, dipoles. And one of the things I'll, I'll explain to you that is uh, unique about the way ERI designs the tracer antennas, those slots can be actually, I mean, those uh, dipoles can be actually positioned in a different way than the slots, which gives you a bit of flexibility uh, for, for the vertical polarization uh, pattern. And that could be really important for uh, those uh, broadcasters that really are trying to uh, reach these cell phones in a particular market area. So if the uh, tower, for example, is west of town, uh, most of the folks using cell phones are going to be in town, then really they just need that uh, V-pole pa power focused towards that town, okay? Uh, so while they might have an omnidirectional uh, pattern in the horizontal plane, uh, in the vertical plane, maybe uh, a cardioid type pattern uh, would be uh, preferable. Again, it's all about getting that energy really where it's going to do the most good so you don't waste um, uh, power uh, uh, in any way. And, uh, and a lot of the <laughs> some of these transmitters that are being purchased right now are quite large. Uh, and even though they've become much more efficient, they have become much more efficient, uh, they're, they're much more powerful. So, so, uh, so electric bills uh, may be going up in a lot of, uh, for a lot of broadcasters. Uh, any questions about this? No? Okay. So really what, what an antenna manufacturer can promise to uh, a broadcaster is what we, uh, we call field strength, okay? That is, um, you know, what is the... Uh, uh, what is the, uh, uh, how, how is that power focus and what is the strength of uh, the signal that will come off that antenna in any direction, you know, both in the horizontal plane and in the vertical plane. Um, so these uh, figures here shown here are the field strength me uh, measurements that the FCC uses to determine what we call the noise limited contour, okay? So on channels 2 to 6, you can see that's uh, 28 uh, dBU or microvolts per meter. Um, and the high band channels at uh, 7 to 13 is 36 dBU, and channels 14 to 50 at uh, 41 dBU. Okay, so these uh, again are the theoretical field strengths. Determine, uh, I should say, the theoretical field strengths determined when the antenna is designed and tested, as determined by azimuth and elevation patterns and gains. The antenna manufacturer guarantees theoretical field strength in free space. Okay, so that's that's an important point, and again, uh, uh, and that's what I was trying to say a minute ago. Um, as, as an antenna manufacturer, all we can do is test what the, uh, you know, what those field strengths are. Again, uh, they're, they're measured, uh, they're, they actually can be predicted by software, okay, and that's what we typically do. Uh, they can also be modeled in an anarcha anarchaic chamber. Uh, NARI has one of the largest anarchaic chambers in the, in the country. Um, so it can actually be modeled in an anarchaic chamber as well. Um, but when it comes to actually uh, determining what kind of coverage the broadcast is going to get, that's where your consulting engineer comes in <laughs> because there are parameters outside of our control that will actually determine what your coverage uh, will be, okay? And that has to do with other factors such as terrain uh, and uh, uh, interference primarily uh, and, some, and some other factors. Uh, atmospheric conditions and weather, I, I didn't realize they were on the, on the slide, okay? <laughs> uh, electromagnetic interference uh, from other broadcast signals. 
So again, these are the kinds of things that are outside the control of the antenna manufacturer uh, that, uh, that will really affect uh, what kind of uh, coverage uh, uh, can be expected. But there's a lot more powerful software available today to consulting engineers. They could do a, lot, uh, a much better job of this than they, than they did in the old days when we basically had an A and B and a city grade contour. <laughs> That's basically what you, what you got from a consulting engineer. Antenna location. Um, the ability of an antenna to provide adequate field strength for reception to FCC licensed area to an FCC licensed area is determined by effective radiated power, ERP of the antenna. ERP is measured in kilowatts, determined by input power of the antenna. Okay, yeah, all right, I'm sorry. Um, didn't mean to read this to you, but in any case. So ERP, or effective radiated power, again, is one of the two uh, things that uh, the FCC is primarily concerned with because that uh, because with the ERP and the antenna pattern data uh, and the software that's used, uh, which is commonly referred to as TV study, uh, will determine what that, uh, uh, how that uh, station should uh, uh, be performing in a particular market area uh, and how they might interfere with other uh, channels, other broadcasters, et cetera. And again, what this slide's saying is that, okay, so that, that number is actually determined by figures that primarily come from an antenna manufacturer. Uh, the gain figures of the antenna, uh, the loss in the transmission line, and the filter or RF system, um, and then uh, and then the TPO. TPO stands for transmitter power output. So um, so with uh, knowing the uh, transmitter power output, um, the filter loss, uh, any other RF losses that might be in switches, uh, and the uh, transmission line loss. That's determined by the size of the line and the length of the line. Uh, and uh, an antenna gain, you can uh, calculate for a broadcaster, you know, what the ERP of that, uh, that uh, station would be, uh, given that it, uh, it builds out that type of antenna system. And here we have some uh, limits to ERP uh, as determined by uh, FCC rules. Um, admittedly, I'm, I'm not as familiar with those. What I can tell you is that most broadcasters today, um, given the fact that the, the repack um, it has uh, reimbursable costs uh, are oftentimes uh, building out to uh, the maximum power that uh, is allowable by uh, uh, by virtue of the, the interference that they might cause. So uh, we're seeing a lot of 1,000 watt uh, uh, UHF stations being built out. Question. Yes. Well. The example I used a little earlier about the dolphins don't have antennas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to get that energy down there and not out in the ocean. Right. Yep. How much leeway do I have in installing the ramp up? Mm-hmm. Um, or is that well, the free mind consultant and the FCC? Well, yeah. I mean, uh, if you're talking about a station that might have a, a, a tower in Roxborough in Philadelphia. Right. Yeah. I mean, really... Um, Again, uh, I mean, Philadelphia would be a, a wide, you know, has a lot of potential viewers all over the area, right? Um, it would be unlikely that you would try and focus the signal from your main uh, antenna uh, to that particular island uh, wall. Would a lot of, what's that? Long Beach Island. So. Yeah. So what? So what I find in Florida, for example, and, and the same thing could be done up here, right? Um, you know, the stations in Orlando, for example, they'll put a translator out there in Daytona Beach to cover all the people that are out there, right? So not only are they covering a, uh, covering a large market area in the Orlando area, but they're putting some additional power on a different frequency. That's what a translator does, right? It's a different frequency, uh, but they're putting another uh, uh, signal on a different frequency out there uh, along the beach so that they can, uh, as you're saying, well, um, improve the uh, power, uh, the signal strength in that area without wasting it uh, in, in areas uh, that might be over the ocean or even between the tower and, and, the, and that coastline. So that's one way of doing it. And there's actually going to be additional opportunities to do that kind of thing going forward. That gets into ATSC3 and what we commonly refer to as signal frequency networks. Uh, that uh, And all that's uh, going to be rolled out over the next five to ten years, like we predict. 
That's a good question. That's, um, that's where translators come in. Um, and I spent quite a few years <laughs> in that part of uh, the business. Pardon me? A bunch of them. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're very, that's a very good way to uh, get your signal where you, uh, where you want it in a fo very focused way. Okay, so for the different bands, um, there's different types of antennas. Okay, so, um, and this is all wavelength related. Uh, wavelength is uh, inversely related to frequency. So at uh, low, low channels, uh, the frequencies are, uh, are quite large. And at high channels, uh, the frequencies can get uh, relatively short. And that uh, actually drives what kind of antennas are, are well suited for, for each particular service and each particular band. So bat wing antennas uh, are commonly used in the VHF band. Uh, not so much anymore. And quite honestly, ERI does not make them. Um, we use panel type antennas for, for those applications. Um, slot antennas are commonly used in the high band uh, part of the uh, television broadcast band and in the UHF band. That's, uh, they're the primary um, antennas for, uh, for, uh, for broadcasting in the, in the UHF band. Uh, panel antennas, uh, again, can be used for uh, VHF applications and UHF applications. And they're becoming a bit more popular because uh, there is a number of uh, applications where, uh, where the uh, antenna actually needs to broadcast more than one frequency. Um, so a slot antenna is really um, a single or, or two channel antenna at the most, okay? Once you get beyond uh, 12 megahertz, uh, uh, the antenna performance uh, drops dramatically. Uh, so panel antennas um, are typically uh, designed to cover an entire band, either low band VHF, high band VHF, or UHF. Now, of course, the UHF band is the largest, so that's, uh, that's quite a uh, range of frequencies. But ERI makes antennas, and others make uh, panel antennas that cover the entire UHF band. Um, as we transition from, uh, during this repack, from old channels to new channels, uh, panel antennas are also uh, uh, becoming an important part of... Uh, of the transition because they can be used for what is called the interim antenna by the FCC, an antenna that will operate on both the old channel and the new channel, allowing the broadcaster to, let's say, go off their old channel antenna while they're changing it out um, and at the same time um, serve as a, uh, an antenna that can be used on the new channel, again, perhaps while the new channel antenna is being installed. Um, so ERI has some un uh, unique products and, uh, for those applications as well. I might have failed to mention earlier, uh, and it is a, an important point here, actually, uh, that um, the FCC is reimbursing broadcasters for making this move um, from their old channel to their new channel. Um, and again, I'm sure that some of you in the room are, are aware of that, but maybe not. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's quite a, uh, an opportunity for broadcasters to upgrade facilities uh, with, with most of the costs covered by virtue of the fact that they're moving to a new channel and the FCC is covering those costs. But going to an elliptically polarized antenna, for example, is a way to upgrade your service while the FCC is paying for uh, most of the antenna. They won't pay for the upgrade to the elliptically polarized uh, version of the antenna. So what we find uh, as an antenna supplier is that we have to actually quote a horizontally polarized antenna, if that's what is being replaced, and an elliptically polarized antenna. So the FCC so the broadcaster can tell the FCC what's, what's a reimbursable cost and what is not. Um, but uh, it's, it's part of what's driving, uh, you know, kind of a, a resurgence in, in broadcasting uh, from a RF standpoint, from a, uh, an over-the-air broadcast signal standpoint, because a lot of broadcasters are taking full advantage of the fact that they, these are reimbursable costs to significantly upgrade their signals, um, primarily in preparation for the idea that we'll move to a, a more mobile uh, service, again, called ATSC3. Hey, Joe, I have a question. Yeah, On no. the uh, antennas that they're able to go ahead and use to serve two purposes, the old frequency and the new, is that just a case of a broadband antenna being able to go ahead and cover that, or, or is it one particular set of slots and you're able to do something down here and something here? Combine it in one antenna. How's that handled? Yeah, no. Um, I mean, if, if the um, okay, if the channels are close enough, and in yeah. some cases they are. Which is broadband. Right? Um, you get, so you know, there's one bread cancer I'm working with, for example, has channels 14 and 15, right? Okay, right. So we can actually use a slide antenna there because right. we have an antenna that'll cover two channels, right? Sure. 
Um, you know, the performance is not quite as good on one as the other. Again, so we, uh, you know, there's those kind of minor uh, issues. But, but in general, that, uh, that can be a good solution for somebody that's got adjacent channels. Um, uh, I think New Jersey Network has a, uh, is moving, uh, and uh, Waterford uh, works from 22 to 23. They're going Correct. back to the rolled analog channel. So here again, you know, if the antenna is a slight antenna, but broad enough, it, it doesn't have to be replaced. It could be used on either one of those channels. Um, but in most cases, okay, they're unique cases. In most cases, you know, you have somebody moving from channel 51 to channel 25, let's say. Right. Okay, so a slide antenna can't do that. Right. Uh, so you need a panel antenna. A panel antenna is specifically designed to cover a wide range of frequencies. That wide? Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, this, you'll, the specs for our antennas will cover 14 to 69, even though <laughs> we only need 14 to... Uh, well, no, no, I should clarify. We're only going to need 14 to 36 going forward, but some of these stations are coming off 51, right? Yeah. Because 51 is the old uh, top end of the, the UHF band. So, yeah, if you're on channel 51 uh, now and, you wanna, and you're moving to 25, then you need an antenna that will uh, perform pretty well on both those channels. That's a panel antenna. So one of the things that ERI came up with, if, um, if I can focus on this since Stan brought it up, um, is an antenna, uh, panel antenna, oh, well, maybe I'll wait. <laughs> panel antennas have a disadvantage of being flat because they have a, a back, a back uh, pa uh, uh, plane, right? Um, and so they represent a greater wind load on the tower. Okay, so that's traditionally been one of the reasons why U.S. broadcasters have uh, shied away from them. So uh, ERI uh, uh, challenged our uh, supplier. Uh, the Europeans uh, have been using panel antennas for decades. Sure. So the expertise in panel antenna systems really comes out of Europe. So uh, like our competitors, we have uh, an overseas uh, supplier of panel antennas. And we challenged that supplier to come up with a uh, an, an inner, inner antenna that would be of a lower wind load. So what we did is we had them design a, uh, a uh, cylindrical antenna, uh, an antenna that has panels mounted inside a cylindrical radome uh, that uh, is very light, uh, has a low wind load, and can cover any channels, as I said, from 14 to, to 69. How are you tying them together for gain? Okay, so it's, uh, it's basically a 10-foot module that, okay. that is an, an eight-bay antenna, okay? Really? So it, it comes in only two patterns, a uh, narrow cardioid and a wide cardioid, and it can only be stacked uh, either as uh, two modules or three modules. So basically you have three, type, three gains, uh, um, elevation gains, uh, a one module, two module, or three module. Uh, and then again, you have the narrow or the wide cardioid pattern. And they're elliptically polarized. Uh, so what is really nice about these antennas is that um, going forward, the broadcaster, a, a, even though it's been paid for by the FCC as an interim antenna, can keep it as an auxiliary <laughs> antenna. So the, uh, the broadcaster has the advantage, uh, if they can justify an interim antenna uh, uh, through, the, uh, through the reimbursement program, um, uh, they can, uh, they'll have an, an antenna that maybe they didn't even have before. <laughs> some some stations we find that didn't even have an aux antenna, but uh, going forward they will. <laughs> so uh, again, the wind loading is very critical um, if you want to leave it on there. Uh, some broadcasters have kind of uh, um, decided that they don't want an interim antenna because if they are, if they're leasing space on another tower, then then it increases their uh, rental cost, right? So we're, we're seeing a, a nice uh, demand for it, but uh, uh, anyway, there's uh, you know it's a tricky part because yeah, if you're not on if you're leasing space, then you might be actually creating a, a greater operating cost down the road. Joe, when you're stacking that antenna, question, other, just uh, mm -hmm. be brief, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, is this a case of you can take two or three panels and make it actually end fed, or is it a power divider that winds up feeding these panels when you expand to two, two or three panel systems? Yeah, so if um, in the case where you have a two or three module system, yeah, you have a feed system, of course. You have a transmission line comes up and feeds a power divider. Okay. And then the power divider uh, in turn feeds uh, each of the panels. Now, again, uh, these are elliptically polarized antennas, so they have two inputs. And those inputs can be phased in any number of ways right. to increase uh, your vertical polarization or to, or to just make it an H-pole antenna, for that matter. How By much power can you hit them with? 20 kilowatts a module. Really? Yeah, so it's a high-power antenna. Damn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you very much. Oh, good question. Mm -hmm. So this is a bat wing antenna, and uh, for those who are uh, 
used to operating in the VHF band. This might be a very familiar uh, antenna to them. Um, but again, um, ERI is uh, unfortunately not making them uh, uh, these days. Um, it has certain advantages. It is a broadband antenna. It will cover either the entire low band, channels 2 to 6, or high band 7 to 13. You get a good omni pattern out of it, and, um, and it represents a relatively moderate wind load. Uh, the disadvantages are it has to be top mounted. Uh, it's H pole only, which is a real disadvantage with uh, everything that's going on in the industry. Uh, it's an omni pattern only, so there's no options there. But it's very complicated and hard to build, has long lead times. And with all the work that we're facing right now with the repack, it turned out to be something that we felt uh, we just didn't have the resources to, uh, to pursue. <coughs> Excuse me. And then there's some other electrical issues that's uh, very sensitive grounding and then icing and uh, high maintenance due to cable issues. <clears throat> okay, so mostly what we, uh, uh, we work with these days are slide antennas. Um, a slide antenna is, uh, uh, well, I'll just read. <laughs> Vertical slots and an outer conductor uh, that uh, serves also as a support pole and single uh, flange input to a single inner conductor. Okay. So basically, this is a, a slot antenna, uh, and, uh, and, and again, in the Tracer series of high-power UHF antennas that we make, and I'm sorry, the, the Tracer is actually a high-power, high uh, high-band antenna as well. Um, it's um, uh, it's end-fed, so the transmission line feeds the antenna at the very bottom, okay, and uh, and the power um, is um, um, runs through the center conductor of uh, that's inside the outer conductor. Um, that represents the um, uh, uh, that, that has the, actually the slots cut into it that actually determines uh, the pattern that is radiated by the antenna, and then the antenna is enclosed in a radome. Fully in, in the case of our tracers, it's fully in, it's a fully enclosed radome as it's actually pressurized as well, and that helps keep uh, the antenna in uh, in good operating condition for for many many years to come. Another way that a broadcaster can upgrade, perhaps from other designs and be rest assured that they'll have an antenna that will serve them well for years, in fact, decades to come. Um, so uh, in a top-mounted antenna, um, there's uh, some mechanical issues that become involved with the uh, antenna design, as you can probably uh, surmise, because the antenna has to support itself. It has no power attached to it except at the very bottom. And so therefore, it must mechanically be able to support itself. So the um, and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the mechanics of all that have to do with uh, where the antenna is actually going to be located. So in, in uh, areas that are, subs, uh, uh, sus, uh, that are in uh, high uh, wind load areas, such as hurricane uh, states, uh, hurricane susceptible states, um, the mechanics of uh, that ant uh, design of that antenna can be uh, very critical because uh, as the mechanical um, um, constraints uh, get into it, you might actually have to go to a bigger pipe as an outer conductor to, uh, to make the antenna self-supportable. And when you do that, you actually change the geometry of how the slots that are cut in to the pipe uh, are arranged, and therefore it affects the, uh, the, event, the, the pattern that, that uh, is the outcome of where those slots are located. So basically, in a slot antenna, you're cutting slots into this pipe, uh, and, have, and you have an interconductor running through the inside and you have uh, um, couplers uh, uh, at the, each of those slots to couple the energy off of the, uh, off the interconductor. So uh, that's, a, that's a real quick overview of how these uh, antennas are constructed. Uh, the advantages of a slot antenna are the pattern flexibility. Um, we have lots of standard azimuth patterns and elevation patterns, including, as I mentioned before, smooth elevation patterns. Um, but, there's, uh, but they can be customized as well, and we deal with customized uh, requirements all the time. Uh, it can be an H-pole antenna only, or it can be elliptically uh, or circularly polarized. Um, it can be top or side mounted. These, an these trace R antennas can actually be side mounted, and when they are, now the, uh, I, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, idea that they have to support themselves is certainly less critical because now, you ha now it's attached to a tower. So the outer, con uh, the, uh, the pipe, if you will, the outer conductor is actually uh, made of aluminum. It's to, so it's lighter in weight. You don't need the strength that you need uh, on a, in a top-mounted antenna. So the, uh, the antenna becomes much lighter in weight. Um, uh, 
Uh, but again, that's another advantage of the trace R design. It can be side mounted as well. Um, it may be fully radome enclosed and pressurized, and that's the way we build 90 plus percent of our antennas. Occasionally, we get an, uh, customers that don't want them pressurized, but yes, well, I'm sorry. Oh, really? Sunflower. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? Not bad, but it's not what it's moved for. Wow, no kidding. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, these are designed to be very mechanically stable and, um, and airtight as well, by the way. Again, these uh, antennas are meant to be pressurized. So you're keeping moisture uh, out of the antenna. Again, it increases the longevity of the antenna. Um, uh, the entire uh, feed system from the gas barrier inside the transmitter building all the way through the antenna is all fully pressurized and, uh, and airtight. Um, it's, uh, these antennas have a low wind load because they're cylindrical. Okay? Uh, they're resistant to ice. Ice has, uh, can't form on these uh, uh, radomes uh, as easily. Um, and again, simple construction, very e uh, economical in terms of getting as much gain uh, out of an antenna. Um, for, uh, for X amount of dollars. Uh, disadvantages, as, as we discussed a few minutes ago, they're narrow band. Um, they're really built for one channel or, or an adjacent channel, or one channel and it's adjacent channel only. Uh, and the beam tilt and null fill uh, can be a bit limited. So again, um, every design has its advantages and disadvantages, but uh, uh, in most cases, uh, the trace R is uh, ideally suited for a high-power UHF application. Yes, sir? How much maintenance is required on the pressurization? Does it have to be repressurized occasionally, or does it last for 10 years with just the, the first pressurization? Well, that's a great question. Um, the, uh, again, the, the entire system is uh, designed to be airtight for many, many years to come. Um, you know, unless there's something that uh, uh, interferes with the integrity of the system, uh, you know, somebody shoots a bullet through one of the transmission lines, um, an O-ring goes bad at one of the flanges, um, it, should, it should keep pressure. Now, with that said, great question again. Um, there's two ways uh, typically to pressurize the line, and that is either with an automatic dehydrator uh, system uh, that, that ERI could provide, uh, or with uh, nitrogen, uh, either a nitrogen tank or a nitrogen generator. Um, some uh, folks I'm finding are really, in, uh, really like the idea of using nitrogen to, to, uh, to uh, pressurize their line. But no, it's a great question. Uh, the, uh, the line, uh, you know, should remain, uh, should keep pressure for, for years to come, but, but there's, there's always going to be um, a minimal amount of leakage, and that's, what, and that's why you, you have to have a dehydrator connected to the system. Um, but the antenna, what I learned actually just recently uh, is that the antennas actually ship pressurized with a pressure gauge mounted to the input cap so that when you take delivery, you can see that the antenna is holding pressure. And if it's not, <laughs> you want to tell the factory, okay? And as the transmission line is being built, um, every day the, the crew is checking the pressure in the line. So they're capping the line uh, and having the line pressurized. So that as you're building up the system, if there is a leak, you catch the leak sooner rather than later. <laughs> okay? So some tricks of the trade, if you will. Another question? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I can't say that I know that ERI has ever built one that way, but uh, I can envision an, an application where that you might want that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, where... Uh, you know, you might be trying to hit uh, potential viewers that, uh, that are not necessarily below the antenna location, um, whether they're in the side of a mountain, let's say. Um, that's the only example I can think of off the top of my head, but that's, uh, that would be one. Um, so it, it would be fairly unusual and, and a fairly unique one. But again, I, I cut my teeth in this business on the translator side way back in, in the uh, early 80s, uh, or uh, most of the 80s for that matter. Excuse me. And, uh, you know, there's all kinds of unique applications like that where you're, the population you're trying to hit is in a valley. They might be on the side of a mountain, right? And you're transmitting from one end of a valley to another side. 
you know, that you can get into some uh, very specific antenna requirements where the directivity of the antenna uh, is very important, especially if their population count is very low. You, you don't want to waste any energy at all, and the transmitters are typically small, maybe only 10 watts or 100 watts of power. So you really want to get that um, antenna focused to where it needs, uh, where the viewers are, are in the area. Any other questions? No? Okay. Uh, so again, we have uh, different types of feed systems. Anyway, uh, and, and I'm sorry, we probably talked about this already, but uh, the Tracer system is an end-fed design, but the ALP system that we manufacture is actually a, a center-fed design. Um, there, there are uh, uh, basically three categories of feed systems, the end-fed, center-fed, and the corporate-fed. Um, and they each has uh, their specific advantages, okay? Uh, the end-fed has a simple, uh, a simple construction. You're just feeding it uh, from the bottom of the antenna, one, one input to the antenna. Uh, it's capable of high power ratings, capable of beam tilts above 0.75, uh, but it has trouble with uh, beam tilts below 0.75. Uh, and in fact, you know, I had one application earlier this year where the beam tilt needed to be below 0.75, and what did we do? We actually went to a, uh, a center-fed design, okay? So again, we're flexible, um, and in some cases, the center-fed design is, uh, is, is, uh, is, is a better approach. Um, not always, but in some cases. So uh, here you have uh, beam tilts uh, uh, up to 0.75. So again, if you need a beam tilt of 0.25, a low beam tilt, uh, 0.5, or whatever, um, the center-fed design is, uh, is preferable. It's, more, it's a little more complex in design. can be power-limited. Um, and uh, it may not do beam tilts above 0.75. Okay, and then there's a corporate fed design, which is similar to the center fed design. Uh, it's a special power, power divider feed system, um, which independent stack slot up modules are fed through a power divider harness. Um, so, um, well, you know, uh, I'll be honest with you. I, you know, what we call corporate fed design, <laughs> oftentimes over the years, called a center fed design. The ALP series is a good example of that. So you have, um, you know, a, a, a basically a four-module antenna uh, that, uh, and these antennas are typically either, um, I mean, a, a four-bay antenna, and these antennas are typically eight-bay to 24-bay. So you're basically stacking four-bay modules, either two, three, four uh, of these modules. Uh, and so you basically have an, uh, an external feed system, uh, which consists of power dividers and harness cables. And... Um, and those are, those are what we call corporate-fed designs, okay? Uh, whereas a center-fed design is actually an antenna that, where the uh, power comes into the antenna and is split at the center of the antenna to feed both the upper half and the lower half. Sorry about that, but there's a clarification there. Mm-hmm. Um, we certainly don't want to back off from the hundred and ten KW ERP or, or TPO. Unless we transfer output power. TPO, okay. We've been running those. I'm not involved in either station. Uh -huh. But we ran those for many, many years. Mm -hmm. um, well, no, I, I mean, there, there are uh, high power center fed antennas, if that's what you're saying. Well, uh, yeah, no doubt. Mm -hmm. now are in fact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I, if, I, if I know which one you're talking about, I, I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here we, here's a, a typical panel antenna system. So you can see what a difference there is between a panel antenna system and a, uh, and a slide antenna. Um, panel antennas uh, are usual, uh, have certain advantages. Uh, again, they're wideband or broadband. Uh, they can cover the whole UHF band for that matter. They can cover the whole high band uh, 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 VHF uh, um, part of the uh, uh, spectrum. A uh, lot of flexibility in the pattern. Uh, that's uh, one of the big advantages of a, of a panel antenna. You can orient these panels any number of ways. 
You can feed them uh, uh, by phasing the, each individual panel. You can come up with all kinds of different uh, azimuth and, 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 um, and elevation uh, plane patterns. Uh, but one of the big disadvantages, as you can probably tell, is that it, re it represents a tremendous wind load on the tower. There's a lot of flat surface areas there, and that, uh, that can oftentimes be an issue for the, uh, for the broadcaster. Um, but we do see a growing demand for these antennas, and uh, so we're quite pleased to have panel antennas to offer. Um, so again, the advantages are pattern flexibility, broadband, uh, they can be H-pole or elliptically polarized, and they can be top or side mounted. Again, disadvantages, high wind load, more complicated and expensive to build, more complicated and expensive to install. You have a lot of power dividers and, and feed cables in the case of an antenna that you're looking at there. So uh, again, um, some of the uh, disadvantages. So again, uh, Getting uh, back to how we design antennas, we can do full-scale modeling at ERI uh, in the anechoic chamber. Uh, again, we have one of the largest broadcast anechoic chambers in the US. Uh, we can model uh, high band VHF and UHF frequencies. We do computer modeling. So oftentimes that's the best place to, to start. If somebody has a unique pattern uh, requirement, we can uh, use our computer modeling to see uh, exactly how that antenna might be built. And if it's a slot antenna, we can actually uh, put it in the, uh, in the anechoic chamber um, uh, and uh, see what kind of results, see if we can verify what we get uh, in the software. And then we have final testing where, um, and I don't know if you would have noticed on the, uh, on the video or not, but uh, ERI constructed three very large uh, high power uh, antenna um, uh, test areas um, that, uh, where we can uh, test, adjust, and record elevation gains um, uh, optimized beam tilts and middle fills, uh, uh, and uh, and even uh, how much uh, ver vertical polarization there will be in the case of a V-pole antenna. All these things are actually uh, uh, done in, in final testing, where the amount of energy that we're coupling off the slot uh, is, um, or the or the or the V-pole uh, uh, dipole, or to the V-pole dipole, can be adjusted in final test. Uh, it's kind of a summary of um, different antennas that we can build for the different bands. Okay, and if anybody'd like to know more about this, I can drill down. But I, uh, um, I'm trying to keep moving along, Jim. Okay, if I'm, I'm okay with time. What's that? Am I okay with time? Yeah, we're. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to real quick uh, get out of here then, okay? And uh, just give you a real quick um, overview on... Uh, I'm going to do a short, short two more seconds. I forgot a couple of things. Well, these okay. Um, if you didn't sign in, please do over there. Um, hi, Paul. <laughs> um, over there also some little uh, giveaways. There's a broad, um, uh, broadband guidebook. It's a lot of valuable information. Um, these little things, if you can't tell what they are, they're actually a screen cleaner for your phone. They stick on the back of your phone and you can clean the screen as well. Um, also, I forgot to mention, the December meeting is going to be at Comcast. Um, right now, it, it's looking pretty good that we're gonna get to see at least a partial tour of the new building. Uh, so uh, that's gonna be a very important meeting to RSVP. When you get the meeting notice, if you're gonna attend, you must RSVP because there's a good chance that they're gonna have to cap the um, uh, Captain Tim, is that right there? Yeah, and uh, it's planned to be a joint SCT meeting. Yeah, so there's going to be more people. to get the paperwork through, so yeah. I'm, I'm scheduling for 50 to 60 that night. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be pretty packed, especially if I can fully get this into the technology center. Yeah. Okay, since... Uh, I'm running a little short of time. I'll, I'll quickly go through uh, the other couple uh, presentations. Um, the antennas are, are really the focus of what we're, we're doing, but transmission line, of course, is a, a big part of what we're doing too. Uh, and ERI makes transmission line, rigid transmission line uh, with a copper outer in sizes from 3 and an eighth all the way up to 8 and uh, 3 sixteenths. Um, we're selling a lot of uh, transmission line, and the reason for that is that transmission line, uh, rigid transmission line, uh, section length is really cr critical to the to the frequency of operation. 
So, uh, so the recommended transmission line section lengths are, are specific to the channel of operation. And, and oftentimes when a, ch a, a broadcaster is moving from one channel to another, they need to go to a different transmission line length. And so we're selling a lot of transmission line for those cases. And again, these costs are all reimbursable by the FCC. Uh, ERI also makes an, uh, an aluminum outer uh, transmission line um, and sizes from 3 and an eighth to 6 and an, and an eighth, okay, and both uh, 50 and 75 ohm again, okay. Um, let me see. We also sell flexible line, uh, Helix cable, the brand name Helix is well known in the industry. Uh, it's the old Andrew br uh, brand name for uh, flexible transmission line. Uh, foam dielectric, air dielectric, anywhere from 7 eighths inch all the way up to 5 inches. Uh, we still see demand for this as well. But again, getting back to what I was saying a second ago, here are the TV channels uh, that are recommended, uh, I mean the, the lengths of uh, rigid transmission line sections. Rigid line is, is typically in sections of 20 feet long, but you can see on certain channels that length uh, does not work out well, so those uh, rigid lines are built in either 19.75 feet or 19.5 feet uh, uh, lengths, okay? And then we also have, uh, for those broadband applications where the, the uh, line actually has to operate on more than one frequency, um, uh, what we call wide line. And here the uh, engineers will go through and decide, determine which line length is best suited for operation on both channels. And these are power ratings, you can see how uh, uh, the power rating uh, increases uh, dramatically, as, uh, especially in the UHF band, uh, from uh, the 3-inch size all the way up to the 8-inch size. So with the, large, uh, with the number of TV stations upgrading their transmitters to anything upwards of 100 kilowatts of TPO, uh, you can see where 8-inch uh, you know, eight, eight line has become very popular. We do a lot of 8-inch line, 7-inch, and 6-inch for most of uh, the high-power UHF applications. Uh, and I passed around the... Uh, 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 one of my props, <laughs> I don't know where it got to, <laughs> but it shows uh, the unique construction that uh, ERI uses for the different thermal expansion uh, that occurs in, trans in the outer and inner conductor of transmission line. So uh, as you have that differential in, in uh, thermal expansion, you need some way to compensate for that. And um, ERI came, came up with um, a design, or Andrew did, I, I should say, years ago. It's called a bellowed inner conductor. Uh, it's actually a corrugated piece that goes at the end of uh, the, the inner conductor that allows the inner conductor to expand and contract and, at a different uh, uh, rate than the outer conductor. Okay, uh, and aluminum and, and copper, uh, these bellowed inner conductors are available for both styles. Um, and you can see down below the difference in uh, coefficients of thermal expansion. So uh, explains partly why the reason for this. The other reason has to do with environmental conditions. Um, solar heating on the outer conductor, uh, for example, for one. And, and here's, a, here's a picture of uh, that bellowed inner conductor and how it's installed in the, uh, inside the, uh, the transmission line. Uh, the hanger systems, uh, again, this is all pretty much determined by software in, uh, in our proposal system. But uh, and again, in the interest of time, we'll just skip through some of these things. We use uh, uh, spring hangers to, again, compensate for the fact that uh, the, the transmission line is expanding and contracting over different, um, in the, under different thermal conditions. Okay. ERI also makes switches, switches are in part of an RF system, coaxial switches, four port, motorized switches, pretty typical. Anything from a three inch size all the way up to six inch size, shown here. Patch panels, also another method of connecting test loads and auxiliary antenna systems to a uh, transmitter. Directional couplers for test purposes, metering. It'll measure power going in one direction or the other. So you're either trying to measure the forward power going in the right direction or the reflected power coming back the other way. Jim, I was going to touch on filters, but if we're out of time, I can skip that. Do we have five more minutes, maybe? Yeah. Okay. 
thanks for uh, hanging in with me here. Um, any questions about any of that? I know I, I skipped through that pretty quickly. So kind of my, making my way back from the antenna, which is at the end of the transmission line, the transmission line that uh, connects the uh, transmitter to the, uh, uh, to the antenna. And then at the, uh, in between the transmitter and the antenna system is a RF system. Um, why do we need a filter? We need to remove uh, harmonics of the operating frequency to protect uh, services or at either the second, third, or fourth harmonic. Um, these can cause interference to uh, non-similar services, uh, to either cellular services or GPS services. Okay, and we use uh, typically low-pass filters to deal with uh, harmonics from the uh, operating frequency. Uh, okay, so we uh, primarily, when we talk about filters uh, and a transmitter system, we're talking about building what we call a mask filter. The mask filter is extremely critical uh, for uh, protecting uh, 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 services outside your assigned channel of operation. And... Uh, and that became extremely critical uh, when we transitioned from digital to uh, from analog to digital television, because the FCC sort of compact the spectrum and put more adjacent channel services in a particular market. So a mass filter today is uh, 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 even more critical than ever, and going forward, it, they're even going to be more critical. Uh, the idea uh, is to pass the uh, the energy in your channel, uh, but reject the energy uh, that's um, uh, coming out of the transmitter, because the transmitter, as linear as some of them can be, is, is not a perfectly linear amplification system. So you're going to wind up with energy on both uh, the lower side of your uh, channel and the upper side of your channel, and that's the purpose of a mask filter. It's a filter that's a bandpass filter um, of uh, uh, X number of sections. The more sections, uh, generally, the, the greater out-of-band attenuation you get. <clears throat> And these filters can also be used for channel combining. Um, constant impedance filter can be used, uh, for example, for combining an adjacent channel uh, through, uh, through, the, uh, through the filter system of, of transmitter one. So you can actually connect transmitter two to, tra to the uh, mass filter system of transmitter one and combine them to uh, feed an adjacent channel antenna system. And I think we, uh, in the interest of time, we'll, we'll skip through most of the rest of this. There might be a couple of pictures here to, for those that might be interested in what they look like. Here's a drawing of a low-pass filter, just to give uh, those that aren't familiar with these uh, uh, RF uh, systems what they look like. You can see, uh, you know, these are typical uh, sizes of filters, anywhere from one kilowatt to 25 kilowatts in the VHF band. And... Uh, And these are what some of those filters would look like. P pictures and drawings, or oh, drawings. <laughs> and an UHF band anywhere from a 10 watt uh, to a 50 watt uh, band test filter. Um, uh, today we mostly sell uh, what uh, we refer to as our UF series. These are UHF filters that are actually uh, broadband and actually are tunable. Uh, but quite honestly, the primary purpose of building filters this way is so we can build a bunch of filters with common parts that can be uh, tuned for any UHF frequency. It has a tremendous production uh, advantage. And knowing how many of these filters would need to be built in such a short period of time, um, it was a logical way to proceed in terms of uh, uh, design. Uh, dual mode filters uh, do not have that advantage, but, uh, but do have certain uh, uh, benefits. And these are uh, typical uh, <coughs> drawings or pictures of, uh, of uh, different types of UHF filters. And this is uh, what we're building mostly this, these days. That's the tunable uh, filter right there. Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, um, you know, I haven't looked at a drawing for a while. I'm just trying to visualize what we had the NAB show. <laughs> Uh, maybe 10 feet long, uh, let's say 8, 10 feet long, and maybe 4, 5 feet high. It can be built in a frame uh, with not only the filter, but any reject loads and, uh, and the hybrids. And in the case of a constant impedance filter, you have hybrids on either end to combine two reflective filters. Um, 
you might have some metering uh, and uh, switching uh, as well. It can all be built into a single kind of unitized frame for either ceiling mounting or, or floor mounting. Quick question. Hmm? Those, those filters, you're, you're filtering out out-of-band power? Yes. So do they re what kind of cooling do they require? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, they, uh, they can be convection cooled mm -hmm. if, uh, if it's a lower powered uh, filter. Uh, if it's a higher power filter, uh, yeah, it needs to either be air cooled, so you might, uh, that assembly might have a fan on it. Um, that uh, they would be the most, uh, uh, the, the most typical ways that you would cool the filter. Primarily air cooled, right? Yeah. Not for any mechanical type of cooling or heating system. Yeah. Um, no. Uh, I mean, you would have a, uh, uh, a liquid cooled uh, load, perhaps. Okay, um, and maybe the possibility of liquid, uh, using some liquid cooling, but uh, I, to my knowledge, we're, we're not doing any no, of that no, for anyone. Okay, so oh no, that's okay. That's a great. That's a great question because uh, yeah, they can be built either way. It's, again, lower powered, smaller ones would be convection cooled. Yeah, yeah Jim. So I was just in a transfer building last week. So oh. Uh, so the as you said, the, these devices are big. Are the the connections? Are they standardized like they are on typical video or audio gear, you know, or, or like is a is each transmitter manufacturer? Are there are there connectivity to the to the transmission line? Are they all are they proprietary or are they all standardized? Oh no, they're all standard uh, EIA uh, flanges that okay. that connect um, transmitter. So you can mix manufacturers, if you don't. Typically, yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, an output from a transmitter might be three and an eighth inch. Uh, you know, once you combine, or, or let's say a cabinet. Well, most uh, UHF transmitters today are all solid state, and they're in cabinets that might be, you know, rated up to, uh, let's say, 20 kilowatts of power. Mm -hmm. So you might have a three and an eighth inch connector, EIA flange on the output of that, and, and a three and an eighth inch line that's feeding a, uh, a combiner. Um, and that might be the input to the, uh, the filter. The filter uh, might have uh, something bigger on the output. Eventually, the filter is going to interface with the transmission line. So, you know, one of the things I deal with sometimes is that, uh, you know, we figure the antenna system ends at the gas barrier, okay? And that's usually just inside the building, and that's where the line is pressurized, okay? Uh, the filter could be right there, or it might be 50 feet away, okay? And if so, um, you know, what the transmitter, uh, what we try and do is coordinate with the transmitter manufacturer who typically would supply everything that goes inside the building up to that gas barrier and make sure he knows what we have at the gas barrier in terms of uh, the size flange and the impedance. Is it a six and an eighth inch 50 ohm system, 60 and eighth inch 75 ohm system? So that, it, so that what they give the, uh, 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 the broadcaster from a transmission side, uh, uh, from the transmission side matches up to what we have. But between the filter and the, uh, and the antenna system and the filter and the transmitter, yeah, that's all uh, standardized sizes, Jim, but it can be anywhere from 3 and 8th to 4 and 16th to 6 inch. But as long as you know what it is, it'll fit. Oh, it's yeah, not, yeah. It's not like you have to worry about manufacturer A and manufacturer C. Right. Okay. Unless it's an apple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So again, uh, just to give you some idea what this stuff looks like, um, different types of combi hybrid combiners are very typical. They're uh, two inputs, uh, an output, and a reject port. Um, a wave uh, waveguide T combiner uh, on the right side. Uh, yeah, that's waveguide. So there is some cases where at very high power UHF levels, you're looking at waveguide uh, components, uh, and that's uh, that's what's pictured there on the upper right hand side. And this is a dual mode uh, and the filter system shown here. They look like barrels, <laughs> um, but they uh, they have uh, tuning uh, cavities that are tuned to a particular frequency to pass the frequency desired, and to reject all the power uh, external to that. And here again, uh, oftentimes uh, the RF system is a unitized system on a frame uh, with a combiner, with a filter, some switching, uh, a load. You can see the load there in the corner. Okay, and transitions from coax to waveguide, perhaps. Well, it would be in that case. <laughs> okay, oops. And there's, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, again, this is what uh, most uh, transmitter manufacturers would be getting from ERI these days. This is the uh, the tunable uh, uh, mass UHF mass filter. 
And again, you can see it's in a frame. So these would typically be mounted uh, on the floor somewhere near the transmitter and then between the transmitter and the, uh, and the antenna system. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Is there any more, any last questions? Right. So, thanks. For, yeah. Why you're saying you think people are going to be watching it like this? You you mentioned that the, the antenna would have to either be vertical or horizontal to correspond to where the phone's going. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't people be watching it like this? What, like what? As opposed to this. Oh, that. Uh, okay, but uh, <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, I'm sorry. I see what you're saying now. Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, no, the idea is that you're. Um, that the radiated signal uh, being uh, transmitted in both the horizontal and the vertical plane, okay, and they're phased in a way that that um, that, that uh, signal is actually rotating. It's actually rotating, um, and because the power in the horizontal and the vertical are not equal, okay, it's not creating like a circular rotation. It creates a, like an elliptical rotation, okay, and that's why we call them e-pole antennas, okay. Yeah, we do make circularly polarized antennas. We call them that anyway. They're not complete. There's no real good circularly polarized antenna of any type. Uh, but you can get close to it, okay? But to answer your question, okay, so the, so the fact that that signal is rotating makes it far less critical that you're holding this uh, receiver, and, uh, which has an antenna. It's the antenna that's critical, of course, right? That, the, that it's far less critical that that antenna is held in any particular direction, or, okay? I mean, we, uh, we all might, most of us might be old enough where we had rabbit ear antennas, right? And how you fussed with them to make sure that you got the antennas at the right angle, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the rabbit ears in the right angle, facing the right direction. Um, well, the fact of the matter is, if the signal is actually rotating, uh, all that becomes a bit less critical. So actually, broadcasting in the vertical plane as well as the horizontal uh, does have some advantages for home viewing, too. And maybe I'm, it's not the right venue to say this, Jim, but <laughs> there is a bit of cord cutting going on. Uh, internet services like uh, that's why we're expanding. Yeah, yeah. There you go, Jim. Right. That's good. Good thing. Like Netflix and uh, Roku and uh, so, and even Amazon Prime. I hear is is is, is chipping away at some of this um, uh, this space. Um, you know, the, the the need for um, over there broadcasting is actually um, uh, growing because uh, viewers that that subscribe to those services, uh, you know, could actually get free over there <coughs> local TV signals. <coughs> so. <coughs> With some additional uh, education as to you know, where to get these antennas and how to orient them, um, we uh, the, the broadcaster could actually improve uh, um, the number of uh, viewers that are picking those signals up off the air. It's a little tricky business that I learned a long time ago um, because um, you know when we transitioned to digital, broadcasters didn't really promote the reception of over-the-air signals. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. Um, and it's partly because some broadcasters, and I can mention one in particular, uh, thought it would be a great idea to pass on the programming cost to cable operators in the way of what we uh, commonly refer to as retransmission fees. And retransmission fees uh, be has become um, a real big part of the revenue stream for a, for a broadcaster. So uh, that's the best explanation I get from any uh, engineer at a local TV station as to why they don't advertise how, you know, what, how to pick these signals up off the air. But if somebody should call the station, uh, the chief engineer, I'm sure, would be glad to uh, help any potential viewer pick up their signal off the air. Joe, uh, I have a quick question. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, just when you were looking at a cell phone, the cell phone, depending on the service, is, is within a certain band. I'm kind of lost here. So mm -hmm. as far as TV is concerned, are you taking and, you, and utilizing the band the phone is cut out for, or, or, or are they, have, have they come up with something where they've expanded the, the, mm -hmm. the frequency on the phone so it's able to, to say, work in that UHF spectrum on this device as mm -hmm. well as whatever your carrier is? That's where I got a little lost. Okay. I don't know if I've articulated this properly. No, no, no. Yeah, no, it's perfect. Yeah, no, no. This is, <clears throat> this is one of the biggest challenges the industry is facing because let's face it, um, Verizon, yeah. uh, T-Mobile, <laughs> for that matter, um, Sprint, all these guys, they want you to use the phones for data. In fact, ironically, I think 
most of us don't use our phones for voice, but we use it for data, <laughs> whether we're surfing the internet or whatever, uh, reading email and so forth. So they're not really inclined to um, participate in this effort by broadcasters to uh, accommodate their signals in, a, in, in one of these uh, devices. So you're quite correct. This device would need to have a ATSC3 receiver built into it. In addition, have an antenna that is uh, better suited for the reception of, of the lower UHF frequencies down to 14. You know, ideally, VHF as well, but that would require a much larger antenna, and that's not practical on a de uh, device of this size, even as some of them are starting to get a little bigger. Um, but um, So that I hope that answers your question. You need a receiver in here and, and an antenna that's suited for picking up signals uh, uh, that, uh, that the broadcasters hope to be able to get into so these that's trends. still down the road. It's still down the road. It's, 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 it's a whole other device. You know what I mean? What's that? It, it, it would be a whole other device. It would be a change of device. Well, what, what some uh, that I spoke to just recently at an IEEE symposium are suggesting is that we could, uh, that um, some, um, some users that would like to pick up all fair signals and watch them on their phone We'll, we'll purchase a dongle, okay, uh, that they can attach. Now, we all know from experience that we don't like dongles, right? <laughs> uh, so while they might serve a purpose in the short term, long term, that's uh, not really a great solution because it's another attachment and so forth. Right, right. So uh, what they're thinking is that if, uh, if we can at least get those out there and we can uh, get um, viewers uh, to enjoy uh, receiving uh, TV signals on these kinds of uh, devices, then there would be some pressure put on the carriers. In addition, uh, and what's a little different than, uh, than, an, uh, than a mobile standard that was adopted um, about eight years ago that, that, that failed miserably, um, uh, big uh, consumer electronics firms like S Samson and LG um, are really uh, pushing uh, ATSC3 uh, in a big way. Uh, the Koreans, and they're both Korean companies, as you probably know, uh, have uh, moved forward with ATSC3 already. They're already broadcasting ATSC3 signals, and, uh, and they are, are helping uh, U.S. broadcasters uh, uh, um, fine-tune the standard and, uh, and will certainly be involved in the design of uh, devices, received devices. So that's probably how it's going to play out. Thank you, You're welcome. Oh. Bill. Yep. Even though your phone is capable of receiving it. Right. Simply because the fact is they don't want you listening to free. Right. <laughs> That's right. Well, you're going to have the same problem. Yeah. Yep. You're trying to cram heavily down your phone. I know. The yep. carriers are trying to throw that switch mm -hmm. on your phone to allow you mm -hmm. to do that. Mm-hmm. Bastard. Well, especially with AT&T, that's not one So they're going to want to. Yeah, streaming radio signals has become uh, very popular, and uh, yeah, enabling an FM receiver on a phone. What's that? Until the football game comes on, uh. <laughs> and they cut it off, and you got to find yeah. separate Oh, yeah, there's rights issues, of course, yeah. That, it, gets, it can get complicated, yeah. Another question? Yeah, just a quick uh, question regarding circular polarity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does elliptical have any impact on problems with reflected signals or ghosts at the reception site? Uh, <clears throat> well, okay, there's, um, okay, so currently we have a, a standard um, that we now commonly refer to as ATSC-1, okay? <laughs> um, and it's a particular modulation standard, uh, and it has, um, and so receivers uh, in, in it that are built for ATSC-1 have uh, what we call adaptive equalizers built into them to deal with uh, reflections or echoes as we call them, okay? Um, and in an elliptically polarized system, and I'd have to think about this a little bit, I mean, uh, theoretically it would seem you could create uh, a greater opportunity for reflections because now you have more signals and more planes that could, uh, could cause uh, additional echoes and, and therefore interfere with the possibility of receiving the signal. Uh, the ATSC3 standard, this is one of the things that um, ATSC3 is going to address. Uh, one are the echoes or the reflections, uh, and two is um, uh, our, um, 
uh, dynamic echoes. Okay, when the, when the phone's moving, right, when we're walking or in a car or whatever, on a subway train or whatever, now we have dynamic echoes. Uh, and so uh, ATSC-3 will deal with that in a, a much better way uh, than ATSC-1 did. Mm-hmm. No, no. If you actually have a circularly, uh, a circularly polarized receive antenna, now you have a even more energy that you can uh, pick up off air to feed uh, your receiver. Okay. You, you have best reception in the circular mode, you're saying? And then as long as you have the complementary casing on the receiving side. Right. So you're receiving right hand, right hand. Also with live phone, same thing. When you get into an area of fire, it's like busy. Okay. You go circular. Mm-hmm. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, COFDM is a, um, a modulation standard that um, <clears throat> a lot of broad, a number of broadcasters have been waiting for for a long time. Yeah, ATSC3 will be yeah, ATSC3 COFDM. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and and that space that I think a lot of broadcasters feel is really critical. I I know we're talking about you know some of the challenges and they are challenges from the business side absolutely, um, and even program rights. You're talking about losing the football game, you know. Um, when uh, when we tried to adopt a mobile handheld standard for ATSC one again about eight years ago, um, a lot of broadcasters thought, "Wow, we can have our uh, our viewers sitting at a football game and watching our our telecast at the same time." Well, Verizon went and swept the program rights right up under the feet of the broadcaster. So Fox and at CBS and NBC had to pull the plug on. Uh, on those uh, mobile broadcasts, the, the mobile signal was a sep was was transmitted just uh, with the uh, with the regular signal, but uh, but there was a separate feed for the programming. So they could <laughs> what they had to do is actually switch off the football game when the football game came on, because Verizon got exclusive rights to um, the mobile coverage of those games. So there are business issues with all this, but it's um, it's it's definitely where viewers are going. Um, you know, uh, the younger viewers in particular. Um, you know, I'm sure most of us here, me included, um, you know, love to watch the football game on, on a, on a uh, you know, 40 plus inch TV set, uh, and, and and most even young people would still enjoy those uh, those presentations better. But but it's becoming a more and more mobile f uh, society, and this is uh, and the one to many uh, aspect of uh, over the air broadcasting does have its advantages in the way of offloading uh, that traffic from uh, from a cellular system. Uh, so there's actually some thought that it could be a complementary service in that way. So if the Super Bowl game's coming on and you don't want millions of people streaming the football game, right, and, down, and, and over, overwhelming the, uh, uh, the system, um, you know, having those receivers in a, in a mobile phone or, or a tablet or what have you, uh, you know, could be a big advantage even to the, to the uh, telecoms. Um, there's another... Um, um, and, and Jim, if we're out of time, we're out of time. But there, uh, to this end, and I'll just mention this real quickly, uh, what a, a lot of broadcasters and broadcast engineers, consulting engineers uh, have envisioned uh, is where you augment the, the one-to-many uh, single-stick uh, um, broadcast uh, model with, uh, with additional fill-in or gap fillers uh, throughout the coverage area uh, that would actually operate on the same frequency. They're called SFN uh, uh, networks where... Um, where the, let's say the main stick's on channel 25, you put additional channel 25 transmitters within your coverage area, and not to, this is not to exceed your coverage area, but within your coverage area in order to fill in the gaps that might be created by terrain or what have you, uh, and urban canyons created by, uh, by buildings, of course. Uh, so it's, uh, it'll be interesting to see how this all plays out, um, but this is a case where uh, these broadband panel antennas uh, might actually find uh, some additional applications 
because uh, some engineers are saying that these, uh, these uh, additional transmitters uh, could be shared by uh, several broadcasters in the same market in order to minimize the cost of building them out. Just a final thought on the subject. <laughs> Thanks so much. I appreciate Thanks, your uh, yeah. Yeah. attention. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Remember, um, November 13th. Um, stay tuned as to the location. Um, but uh, it should be a really interesting program. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this one tonight. Right. And we'll, uh, we'll probably have some other things in the works that will be um, with some real interesting programs over the next, next number of months. Thanks for having me.